jump into it pretty quickly. I see some familiar names on the, the list. Some uh, longtime volunteers on here, some super volunteers that have uh, taken on multiple routes. I see a few names from the Nightjar Working Group. Welcome, thanks for, for joining us tonight. So just some um, logistics as we get started here. So this meeting is recorded. It should already be recording. Yes, it is. And uh, we're gonna make this available to everyone uh, as, uh, as let's see, yeah. We'll make it available on YouTube by this weekend. And um, that way the folks that weren't able to join us tonight can watch it. But um, so with that in mind, you know, classic best behavior. I don't think we'll have any real issues. Uh, you'll notice that you're muted coming on. I will have you stay muted through the presentation. You can use the chat uh, during the presentation. I won't be looking at it until, until the end, um, but my wife Hallie is here tonight to uh, help man the chat. And uh, if questions come up, we're gonna cover questions at the end. So she'll read those off to me at the end and uh, we'll hopefully have lots of time for questions, but give it one more minute because we still have people popping in here and then we'll be on our way. We got 602. All right, let's 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 jump into it. So my name is Logan Parker. I'm an ecologist with the Maine Natural History Observatory. I'm a uh, special species technician with the uh, Maine Bird Atlas that's currently going on. You're going to hear me refer to the Maine Bird Atlas a lot. Um, you know, if you don't know what that is, I, I think you'll get a sense of that a little bit tonight, but we can certainly help you uh, with, with getting that information so you can learn more about that amazing project uh, that's partnered with this project here. Um, the, uh, the main night jar monitoring project, we started just a few years ago. So essentially what we're gonna do, we'll, we'll go through uh, talking about night jars in general, um, and then we will talk specifically about night jars in Maine We'll talk about the main night jar monitoring project. We'll talk about how you can incorporate night jar monitoring into your, uh, your uh, atlasing efforts as part of the main bird atlas. And then we'll have a nice question section right towards the very end. So um, with that, I will begin. So the main bird atlas um, started in 2018. Uh, this is the second run of the atlas. The first run was from 1978, ran until 1983. Um, it's a statewide effort looking to document the distribution and status of Maine's birds. Uh, we're doing a wintering atlas this time around. This is Maine's first winter atlas. So we're also looking at birds that spend the winter here. And uh, anyone can make observations as part of this project, um, whether you're just starting out and you're looking at birds in your backyard or you're an experienced birder and you wanna go out there and help us uh, tackle a bunch of blocks and you know, uh, systematically document the birds in this state. Uh, it's a partnership between many different organizations, uh, state, you know, the State Wildlife Agency, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and a handful of nonprofit organizations. Right down at the bottom, you'll see a link. Um, that's kind of the, the um, front face of the Atlas on the web there. So lots of good resources on that link. Um, Hallie, you can put that link right in the chat. So main.gov slash bird atlas. So as part of the bird atlas, there are a number of special species projects. And these are projects that are more directed efforts that are trying to collect observations of birds that otherwise might be missed by traditional monitoring. So these are birds that are active when we're asleep or they're highly secretive and 
Uh, you don't see them typically while you're out birding. Um, then we also have a, a, a nest box monitoring project that uh, they're not necessarily species that are hard for us to document as part of the atlas, um, although owls certainly can be. Um, but this gives us a, those projects give us a chance to uh, observe their breeding um, more directly and we're able to confirm the breeding of those birds in this state through those projects. We have a number of nest boxes. Actually, we still have a handful of boxes still available, totally free um, for folks that are interested in that. You just need to get in touch with me. All right, so we'll start sort of at the beginning. So what is a night jar? Uh, that's a question that comes up a lot. A lot of times that when I've done these presentations, um, I've had folks come to the presentation with no idea what a night jar is to begin with. I suspect many of the people in this crowd tonight do know what night jars are, but we'll, we'll talk about them. They're a really interesting uh, order of birds. So they're generally all very cryptically plumed. So they're very difficult to pick up in their environment. They are well camouflaged. And uh, most of them are either nocturnal or crepuscular, meaning they're active on the edges of the day, whether that's dawn or dusk or both. Uh, generally, they all have really short, tiny legs um, very small bills and really big mouths. Um, I'll give you an example of that shortly. Many of them have long uh, rictal bristles, which are those whisker-like um, feathers that you see around the mouth of the bird on the, the bottom picture there. And they have uh, pectinate toes, which you can see also in the bottom picture in the sketch, that look, it's their central toe and it looks almost like a little comb. Um, it's just an appendage that some other birds have, uh, herons also have, uh, pectinate toes. Uh, night jars being active in the, the dark, darker parts of the day um, have very large eyes and large numbers of rod cells in their eyes and a special reflective structure in the back of the eye called the uh, tapetum lucidum, which uh, translates to, I believe it's bright tapestry. And it's what makes uh, their eyes so reflective. And essentially it's like a mirror in the back of their eyes so that when light passes through the eye, it bounces off that and back through their eye again. So they have twice, twice the chance to pick up light. So night jars for a long time were referred to as goat suckers. And actually they still are uh, referred to goat suckers if you look at their, their taxonomic name. Um, so this is a sort of pervasive uh, superstition that lasted for hundreds of years uh, that night jars drank milk from goats and the likes of Aristotle and uh, Pliny the Elder all uh, had accounts of night jars uh, drinking goat's milk and some of them, the, the uh, side effect of that was that the goats went blind. But uh, in, in all truth, uh, night jars are largely all insectivores. You see you have an asterisk there because uh, there are some exceptions to that. Um, where this came from, uh, people can only speculate uh, that perhaps the birds were drawn to the goats by the insects that would be found around the goats and that they were actually just taking advantage of, of that food source. They weren't, they weren't likely drinking milk. So where does the name night jar come from? So this picture you see here is of a European night jar. It is the, the first bird to be referred to as a night jar, at least according to what records we have. Its uh, common name was simply night jar for a period of time. And it got that name because it was active at night and because it made a jarring sound. So night plus jar, night jar. Um, that's become the uh, preferred family name. Um, many different species are referred to as night jars. So in general, um, most night jars do not construct nests. They lay their eggs straight onto the ground, right on whatever substrate that they're, uh, that's found in their environment. And that can range from things like leaves or gravel or sand. Um, some lay nests right out in the open, others are undercover. Um, and to uh, protect themselves, they rely on that cryptic plumage I was talking about. So they are incredibly difficult to see when they're on their nest and they hunker down and they close their eyes. And uh, yeah, you could easily mistake them for, for a stone or um, part of the leaf litter. Um, 
So by day, generally, they're spending most of their time just hunkered down in place and they're not likely to flush until you're right up next to them. Um, there's a picture here. These are Egyptian night jars that were photographed by a night jar working group friend, Yohei. And Yohei's lucky. So Egyptian night jars right out in the open, he, he's able to find them a little more easily, although they look really well suited to disappear into the, the desert landscape in Israel. So here's a couple of notable night jars. Um, so we've got the Great Eared Night Jar, which is the largest uh, night jar that's found in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, we've got the Pennant Winged Night Jar and the Standard Winged Night Jar, which are found in Africa. And they have these really elaborate looking uh, plumes that come out of their flight feathers that they use as part of their courtship. So they do courtship displays and they have to go around for the bulk of the breeding season with those, those uh, large feathers trailing off them, which might seem like a liability, but I guess it's a good way to attract a, a mate. All right. So the awkward cousins, so <laughs> nightjar allies. So there are a handful of other ally birds uh, that share the order. Um, so putus, frog mouths, and uh, the owlet uh, nightjars. Uh, Putus being found in South America, frogmouths and outlet night jars uh, primarily in Australia. And uh, I meant to add an oil bird on here, but I forgot. All right, so this one's a little interactive one for you. So why don't you pull up the chat? So night jars are also related to another uh, group of birds here. And if you want to, take a guess in the chat which bird group I am. Uh, referring to. You can put your guesses in the chat. If you want, I'll give it a second. If no one's feeling like taking any guesses, that's fine. All right, I see woodcock, swallows, whips. I think talking about whippoorwills. So yes, certainly whippoorwills. Hermit thrush. All right. Good guesses all the way around. I think it'll surprise you given how much I talked about how elusive night jars are and how hard they are to see. Hummingbirds. All right, on we go. So moving into our next section here. So main night jars. So there are two species of night jar that you find in Maine, the Eastern Whippoorwill and the common night hawk. And we'll talk in detail about both. But as you can see here, they're fairly similar looking, although they have some pretty distinct differences. And they have some behavioral differences too. So Eastern Whippoorwill, and before I get into this too much, so safe dates, you'll see right up at the top, that's an atlasing term. Um, that's a, basically the bookends on uh, the, their hypothetical uh, breeding season here. It's a, uh, a period of time in which we are fairly, um, fairly confident that the birds that we're hearing are um, not migrants that are passing through. So we set these safe dates when we're making observations as part of the atlas to, uh, to have a, uh, a sort of benchmark for making those observations. All right, so um, yeah, so the Eastern Whippoorwill is a night jar species found throughout much of Eastern North America. Um, their song is a onomatopoeic song uh, that they sing during the twilight hours and on moonlit nights. They're, um, you know, a medium-sized bird. They're about the size of a robin, although a little bulkier. Um, they nest right on the ground, right into leaf litter in uh, open deciduous forests or mixed forests or in uh, early successional forests. And actually, they're increasingly being found in sort of uh, scrubby uh, areas as well. They eat primarily insects, uh, moths, beetles, ants, flies, mosquitoes, all those things we are happy for them to eat. So they sing their repeated songs um, from a series of points. So um, I recently had a volunteer reach out about this, that they observed this behavior. And uh, yeah, it's, it's spot on. So they, they sing in a roughly circular pattern. The males sing in a roughly circular pattern. They sing from these 
different vantage points all around their breeding territory. And somewhere in the middle there is likely a nest or a future nest if they att attract a uh, female to their territory. So they sing their song from each of those points regularly on those nights when the conditions are just right. Uh, both males and females incubate the eggs and care for young. Um, when they're disturbed, they do this really uh, flashy uh, tail flashing, well, yeah, really flashy tail flashing display. Uh, they have these white patches on the edge of their tail and uh, they'll just sort of hover in air and flash their tail up. Um, and they'll also feign injury to try to lead off potential predators. Um, they're undergoing widespread declines in recent decades. They're listed as near threatened on the uh, red list. And there's lots of anecdotal uh, evidence of declines all throughout their breeding range. Oh, actually, let's, let's listen to the song of the Eastern Whippoorwill. So I'll play the song. Hopefully I don't blow your speakers out. Um, we tested this earlier and it seemed like it was pretty good, but fair warning, could be loud. So that's the song of the Eastern Whippoorwill. It's like I said, it's repeated. Sometimes they increase their speed. I've noticed that if, if two males are uh, on the edge of one another's territory, they'll sing really, really fast and try to outcompete one another. Um, they can sing for really, really, really long stretches of time without breaks. Um, so that is the Eastern Whippoorwill. So our other uh, night jar is the common nighthawk. Uh, it's a more widespread species that's found throughout much of North America uh, during the breeding season. They migrate uh, to South America in late summer where they overwinter, uh, where exactly they overwinter, we're still, we're still figuring that out. Um, their migration is one of the times where they're the most visible because they will migrate en masse and you'll see these huge groups of nighthawks flying through, um, or historically you saw really huge groups of nighthawks, but you still can see some pretty good numbers flying through. Um, they also nest out on the ground, although they nest in more open habitat and uh, they actually will nest right on um, gravel rooftops in urban areas. Uh, they also eat uh, a number of insects and they'll forage right out in the city under street lights. And uh, if you've been to, uh, you know, a sports game outside at night, if you see birds flying around the, the, the lights there, it's a very good chance that they're, they're night hawks. They're frequently uh, present at those, at those events. Um, they perform aerial courtship and uh, territorial defense. Um, this includes the uh, males flying around the territory, calling and diving, and in their dive, they make this really crazy rushing sound. And it's actually, a, uh, they refer to it as a boom, but it's, it's a mechanical sound of the, of the uh, wind passing through their wings. So I will play a recording for you. So you'll hear it, um, you'll hear them calling, they have a um, very raspy call, um, and then the boom is a really unusual rushing sound. So listen for listen for the call and the boom. That was the boom. And so they generally they generally boom only during the breeding season. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I've heard uh, reports of them booming uh, on migration, but generally it's during during the height of the breeding season, and they're using it to advertise their their territory or to uh, ward off potential predators or attract a mate. All right, so I said that there were two night jars in Maine and I was not lying, but there is a third night jar that's uh, increasingly cropping up here and that's the Chuck Wills Widow. Um, it's a night jar species that's generally found in the Southeast. Uh, it also sings an onomatopoeic song. Uh, that's where it gets its name. It's a little bit larger than the Eastern Whippoorwill. It's got a uh, larger head. It's, they're pretty darn pronounced if you see them side by side. Um, they eat primarily insects, but they do, they're actually capable of eating small birds, bats, and even frogs. They've 
we've seen them hopping along the ground and grabbing frogs before. Um, so uh, whippoorwills and um, chuckawills widow hunt primarily in the same way, and that's that they hunt from a stationary site and they use their uh, incredible eyesight to look up for um, prey passing by, and then they shoot up and grab it. So they sally forth, grab it back to their perch. Common nighthawks, by contrast, they're more active earlier in the evening, and uh, they are uh, very active uh, aerial insectivores that will uh, chase down their, their prey um, in flight. So, so the Chuckles Widow um, has actually been expanding its range uh, slowly along the coast, the east coast. Uh, there are no records in Maine prior to 19, the 1970s, um, and they are still quite rare here. Uh, but they are being observed here. Um, there's been a Chuckwills widow in Orland uh, fairly consistently for the last handful of years, and then there's been a you know a scattering of other um, observations of this bird in um, you know other parts of the state, and and even actually over in the Maritimes, they had a few records last year. Um, so breeding has never been confirmed with this species. So can't call it a breeding bird yet, but. Who knows? We may get there. Oh, and I'll play you the Chuck Will's Widow song. It's similar to the Eastern Whipper Will, but it has its own rhythm and sound. So that's the Chuck Will's Widow. And they also make a uh, I make a number of other sounds, including a hissing sound, which you're going to get to hear here. So I told you that night jars have large mouths, and this is a great demonstration of that fact. And uh, Chuck Will's widow in particular have a really, really big mouth. So yeah, very, very large mouth, good for catching lots of prey. And uh, full disclosure, if you're wondering why there's a Chuckwills widow in a shoebox, uh, it's at a, a rehab facility. So this was an injured bird. So no one just collected a Chuckwills widow in their shoebox. Okay, so the status of night jars in Maine. So anec anecdotal evidence suggests that there's been widespread decline. So this is one of those classic birds that, um, you know, regularly people say, oh yeah, we used to have whippoorwills around. We used to have them every summer and, you know, oh, now we don't. Or, you know, there were so many whippoorwills, you know, we used to, they used to keep us awake at night. Not so anymore. Um, they're not nearly as common as they once were. Uh, Eastern whippoorwill and common nighthawk are both listed as species of uh, greatest conservation need in Maine. Um, they're, uh, They've been listed as special concern, threatened, endangered by other uh, state wildlife management agencies in the Northeast and uh, by in, in, in other countries. Um, so a species that requires some serious conservation attention because of their pronounced declines. However, uh, picking up their declines is a challenge. So we'll talk about that. So potential threats to night jars, there's a good handful. <laughs> Um, that we're, we're still trying to figure out exactly what it is that's, that's driving these declines. Uh, very well, it could be that a number of things are driving these declines. So, uh, you know, degradation of habitat certainly could be a driver, you know, the changing landscape. Predation from free roaming pets. We know that cats get them sometimes. We know that dogs get them sometimes. Uh, they're hit on roadways. So if they're, one of their singing spots happens to be on a road, a chance that they're going to get hit by a passing vehicle. Uh, pesticide pollution, uh, neonicotinoids could be directly or indirectly impacting things and the uh, the decline of their their prey species also may be a factor. And so large uh, silkworm moths like the polyphemus moth and scropia moth are also uh, another group of animals that seem to be just fading away. And these are 
species that um, you know they nightjars rely upon for prey. So monitoring nightjars is fairly tricky. So they're active, like I said, when most of us are are uh, winding down for the day and we're not out birding. Um, whippoorwills call on clear moonlit nights uh, during just a handful of months in the year, primarily May and June, a little bit of July. So not a huge window of time. Uh, they're very fickle about the, the conditions under which they, they will uh, vocalize. So it has to be clear, it has to be calm. The, uh, you know, you don't want any precipitation. So they're quite picky. Um, Nighthawks, they're a little easier to pick up because they're active a little bit earlier during the day. Um, and uh, they're a little more conspicuous because you can actually see them flying around, whereas the whippoorwill you're only hearing. And because of this, uh, most of the traditional bird monitoring projects uh, like the Breeding Bird Survey or, you know, um, something like the Christmas Bird Count, well, they're not here in the winter, um, but yeah, the Breeding Bird Survey, they're doing sur surveys, you know, during the morning hours. They might get a whippoorwill on their first, their first survey, but it's even that's unlikely. And uh, so they're kind of falling through the cracks. So there hasn't been a lot of effort made, at least in this state, to document them um, because they require such, such uh, designed survey efforts to meet their very uh, fickle conditions. So uh, that's where this project comes in. Uh, so the main night jar monitoring project as I said, started in 2017, uh, specifically to collect observations of these birds. Uh, the primary part of the project is this road-based survey. We've got 63 routes that are uh, all throughout the state that pass through areas of suitable, suitable whippoorwill habitat. Um, they are monitored annually uh, to document these, these uh, changing trends and their distribution in the state. Um, always working to improve that. And uh, this project uh, started off kind of as like my little <laughs> pet project that I wanted to get off the ground. And then I, I started working with the Maine Bird Atlas and uh, they were excited about this project and, and connected it uh, to the atlasing effort. And so uh, that's been great for this project. Uh, we've got uh, a larger list of volunteers and uh, yeah, so we're working to cover these routes each year. Um, so what does the project entail? So these routes, these 63 routes are all made up of 10 points. Um, each point takes about six minutes to survey. They're a mile apart. And uh, essentially what you're doing is you're doing passive listening. So there's no broadcasting of any calls. You're just simply stopping at each site and listening for um, six minutes, writing down all of the birds that you that you hear, those ones that you're able to, you know, uh, confidently identify. Um, each route needs to be surveyed two to three times per season. Um, once at sunset, and that's primarily targeting the uh, common nighthawk and other birds that are active at sunset. And, and then again, at the uh, after the moon rises. And so there are some um, lunar periods that uh, we've, we've established uh, for volunteers to make these uh, their windows essentially when volunteers are to make these surveys. And uh, when a whippoorwill is de detected, we have the route, that route gets flagged to be rerun by that volunteer. Um, so the commitment, it's about, it's about an hour and a half uh, for each survey. So a fairly small um, commitment each year. So other species, so there are obviously a number of other species that are active at dusk and on um, moonlit nights. So being familiar with a, a handful of these species is great. Uh, we want you to document as many of them as you're able to, as you're able to confidently do. Um, so birds like the American woodcock, uh, barred owl, uh, there are a number of thrush species that are active right, uh, right before the sun sets. Uh, swifts are also active uh, right before the sunset. So, being familiar with these species is really helpful, but um, you know the most the, the thing we're most interested in is if you're able to confidently identify and, and record observations of those nightjar species that I told you about. So that's 
we do have a lot of resources available though if you're interested in if, if you want to learn more about documenting these other species you want to become more uh, confident at identifying them and so i'll share those with you shortly all right so here's another chance for you to take some take a guess here and if you've already seen my presentation which i know some of you have um, don't you know hold back don't guess what what do you think the most reported species in the main night jar monitoring project is i'll give you a minute to go into the chat and take a guess and i will queue it up for you All right, so I'm seeing some guesses coming in. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, Evan, you can't guess. All right, so um, we've got swallows, owls, hermit thrushes, oven birds, barred owls, barred owls, robin, barred owls, woodcock, robin. Let's see. So those are all great guesses, and they are all all species, <laughs> Homo sapiens. Yeah, there are a handful of, of them out too. Um, there are a number of these species do show up very regularly during our surveys. So correct answer, and one of you was correct. Correct answer is the oven bird. So yeah, this little warbler is actually our, our most reported species. Although it was really close last year, uh, hermit thrush was, was right up there. So that was a good guess. So uh, oven birds do this, uh, flight song, uh, this little courtship song at night. And uh, I'll play that for you. So it's this very jarbled up song. Um, and you, you can actually see it. So I've, on, on moonlit nights, I've actually seen them. They'll fly up and do this song hovering right above the, above the uh, canopy. And uh, if it's a nice bright night, you can sometimes see them shoot up there and uh, give this really jarbled song. And occasionally there's a little teacher thrown in there, which is a nice little, nice little clue. All right. So good guesses, everyone. All right. So there are a number of other uh, forms of wildlife that are active and vocal at night. So being familiar with these is also very helpful. I've heard all of these during night jar surveys. So there are a number of insects, you know, crickets and cicadas certainly are active. Uh, coyotes, I've heard them sounding off. Um, lots of different amphibians if you're near a wetland area. Um, you've got the, the peepers and the, and the wood frogs in the early part of the season. And then you'll hear lots of bullfrogs and uh, green frogs and, and the like. So being familiar with them so that they're not getting confused for another species is very helpful. Occasionally you might hear some awful screeching sound that is probably a, a, a fox vixen scream. Um, so be prepared for that. That's, good. That's a good thing to be familiar with so you're not alarmed by that. All right, and occasionally you might stumble across something rare or unusual during your surveys. Um, so there's a handful of species that we, uh, we strongly encourage putting some extra effort into getting some more um, concrete evidence uh, for, and that would be birds like the Chuckwills Widow, Boreal Owl, Long-Eared Owl, Short-Eared Owl, um, Eastern Screech Owl if you're outside of York County, Yellow Rail, certainly. Um, so these are species that are either, they've not been documented as breeding within the state, or we think that they're breeding within the state, and we're, we're not really sure of their, their um, distribution within the state. So they um, are, tend to be very secretive and, uh, and require some, some more um, effort on your part. And it's not a really difficult thing to do. It's essentially just take down some notes of, of what you heard or what you think you heard, why you, why you think you heard that. Um, but one of the best things you can do is just have your phone handy or some type of recording device and uh, you know, get a recording if you hear a vocalizing bird uh, that you think is one of these birds on this list, um, or take a video. Um, whatever you have on your phone is 
it's perfectly suitable. Um, do, do the best that you can just to get a recording of that. So you think you hear a long-eared owl at your point. Um, yeah, you, you have my permission to, uh, <laughs> to take, take a second to take out your phone and get a recording of it um, or stay for an extra 30 seconds after your, your survey at the point to try to get an observation before you move on. But yeah, this is really important. So um, definitely encourage you to do this. All right, so the timing of, of these surveys. So uh, it depends on where you are in the state. So we've got Southern Maine, Northern Maine, um, and that really means um, south of Augusta or north of Augusta. Uh, if you have a route that's in Augusta, it kind of waffles in the middle there. But um, so if you're down in Southern Maine, sunset surveys, you can start uh, the, the general survey period runs from May to uh, May 25th until June. Um, 30th, and uh, yes, the first cycle I've done is the 19th there. I did fix that. Um, so yeah, the moonrise surveys can be conducted. Those should be conducted uh, only under um, these, uh, the strict environmental conditions, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and when the moon is 50% or more illuminated. So if it's waxing or waning, it's got to be at least 50% uh, illuminated. And let's see. All right. And oh, yeah. OK. Right. Got it. OK. So, Northern Maine, uh, Eastern Maine, so down east, um, same general period. It runs a little bit later um, for, for Northern Maine. And that's based strictly on the timing of the, um, the uh, night jar arrival. So, we try to account for migrants and birds that might just be uh, passing through or haven't settled on the territory. Um, so the first cycle for Northern Maine is the 25th, starts on the 25th, runs until June 2nd. So that's the first window of time when you can do a moonrise survey if you get that perfect day. Um, and then if you need to do a follow-up survey um, or if for some reason, you know, the weather's terrible during the whole um, first cycle, then you've got the uh, second cycle in June from the 17th until the first to run those routes. So timing, uh, the surveys are conducted at sunset and after the moonrise. So the sunset is fairly easy to um, account for. So you just start 45 minutes before sunset and that'll run about um, 45 minutes after sunset. Depends on how long it takes you to travel from each point. Uh, point to point. The actual survey time is about an hour, but there's travel in there. You're moving a mile each time. The moonrise surveys start, um, you have to at least be uh, 15 minutes after sunset, at least, and the moon has to be visible and above the horizon and 50% or more illuminated. And so um, the moonrise changes throughout the, uh, throughout the summer, and uh, you know, some years it'll be, you know, you'll have to do a do a moonrise survey, you could probably do them right back to back. Other times you might require being up out a little bit later and, and running the moonrise survey, waiting until the, the moon has risen. Um, but we've got all that information for you. Um, we already have all those dates down and everything, so we can make it pretty easy for you. So conditions, as I said, there are some fairly, fairly rigid conditions for when these surveys should be conducted. The sunset surveys um, can be conducted on uh, calm nights to nights with light winds. So, uh, you know, four to seven miles per hour. Uh, just consult your weather app or your, your favorite weather app, um, website. Uh, clear to cloudy conditions are fine. Cloudy conditions are fine for the sunset surveys, just as long as there's no uh, precipitation. So no rain, no snow could happen. Um, Moonrise surveys uh, should be conducted under the same wind conditions. Uh, calm is best. A little bit of wind is, is not the end of the world, but you don't want it to be affecting your ability to hear these birds. Um, and then uh, you've got to wait for those clear nights. Uh, you can survey if there are clouds in the sky as long as the moon is not obscured. So if, if it's uh, patchy clouds and the moon is just constantly uh, behind those clouds and the illuminations, off, then uh, yeah, you wouldn't be able to do the survey. But if there are a couple of clouds floating around out there. No big deal. You can still do your survey. 
So monitoring routes. So this is just a comparison to show the routes that we started with. Um, there were a number of routes that were started uh, as part of an effort in uh, New Hampshire and elsewhere in New England, um, but those routes were not run, I think, or maybe one of them had some, a little bit of effort, but uh, for the most part, those routes were never run. Uh, then we, we, we ran those initial routes in, in 2018 when we partnered with the Atlas, and then we expanded the project uh, in 2019 uh, using the same methods that the original project did and uh, added a number of routes uh, throughout the Eastern Warper Wills range. And um, that's what you see here. So the red are the original routes. Those little dots are all the individual survey points. And then the uh, yellow is the added, the additional routes. So we also have a night jar reserve. So oh, I'll clarify. So each of these routes is adopted by a volunteer and run annually. And, uh, <clears throat> The Night Jar Reserve here is a group of on-call volunteers. So uh, if you don't have a route adopted or there's no route in your area that's adopted, but you do want to help out, uh, you can go to our, our volunteer portal on our website um, and, and help us cover routes in the event of a conflict if uh, you know, a volunteer gets sick or you know, there's something, something comes up and they're not able to participate. You could be on deck to help us cover um, that route, which would be hugely helpful because it's really, really important that these routes are, are run and run completely each season. Um, so um, you could designate the area, whether it's just like your local area, you know, right around your town, or if there's a county that you're interested in helping out with, or if you know you're one of those uh, crazy volunteers that's happy to drive halfway across the state or all the way across the state to cover a route we'd be glad to have you. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for you to, to run routes. And uh, if no routes are available, um, then we uh, would encourage you to Atlas for night jars as part of the main bird Atlas project. So we'll talk about that momentarily. So just a note on safety while surveying. So scouting your route during the day is, is a really important step. It's super helpful. It gets you really familiar with the, the areas. You can see if there are gonna be conflicts, you know, if there's not a good place to pull off, um, you can figure that out during the day. Much better to do that than at night uh, when you're you know, unable to really see what's going on around you. Um, make sure that you're visible. So yeah, reflective vest is a must and a headlamp or a flashlight uh, and uh, when you pull off on the road, make sure you can pull off really safely. Um, you don't end up mired in a ditch uh, and unable to move on to your next point. Um, bring a um, route map, bring your route map, route map with you. That's something that we'll send to you. Um, and share a copy of that with a friend or family member so they know where you're going. Um, I've had folks ask about having partners with them and that's totally fine. Uh, just one of you can run the survey though. Uh, one of you should be listening, but if you want a partner to ride along in the car with you, keep you company, hold your map, um, you know, keep, keep everything, uh, you know, squared away. That's certainly fine. Um, and I've done that many times. It's very helpful to, to have someone along with you. Um, so certainly do that. Um, in general, use common sense, be safe. Oh, and bring plenty of, of uh, bug spray. That's always a good thing. All right, so what do you do if you adopt a route and then you can't complete a survey? So this does happen sometimes. Um, routes do have to be completed annually um, for us to be able to uh, use the, the data most effectively. Um, and so if something comes up, which things come up, uh, and I totally understand that, uh, the biggest thing is that I need to know as soon as possible. So you'd, you'd wanna reach out to me, let me know, um, and I uh, will work to find someone to help cover, whether that's someone from the Night Jar Reserve, whether that's uh, one of the, the special species technicians. Um, we really care about getting these routes covered each year. So, um, you know, I'd rather I'd rather know uh, beforehand and get the route covered than to find out after the season um, and you know have a volunteer fall off the map and then a route doesn't get run. So no shame in it. Just just uh, certainly reach out and let me know, and we'll we'll work to get it covered. All right, so we'll move on to the next little piece of the, the puzzle here, and that's uh, atlasing for night jars. So we went over the main bird atlas at the, at the opening. Um, so 
You know, there are some species that are in our backyard that are fairly easy for us to collect uh, breeding observations on. You know, you can see a, a woodpecker uh, making a nest cavity or you see a bird flying um, to, a, to a nest with a bill full of um, insects. Night jars are a little more challenging, but it, it's a, a fun thing to do. Um, so breeding is rare. I'll show you a map of how many, how many breeding records there are. Um, but uh, really the emphasis in this case is really on raising our surety from the, it's possible that they breed in, a, in an atlas block in, an, in a given area to it's probable that they breed. And how you do that is primarily you're listening for them. So um, there's a number of breeding codes as part of the main bird atlas. And um, one of the possible codes is a singing bird, okay? So if you hear birds singing during their breeding season, during those safe dates, it's possible that they breed there. You know, they're, ad they're advertising on that territory. If we wanna know if the, if we wanna raise that surety up to where they're probable breeding, probably breeding there, um, it's a matter of waiting. Uh, you know, wait seven or more days. If that same species is out there and it's still vocalizing, it's still singing, um, you know, you still have a whipp whippoorwill in the backyard singing seven or more days later, it's probably breeding there. Um, and then uh, for birds like uh, the common nighthawk pictured here, the um, courtship display that we talked about, the boom sound is a, uh, is higher on the list of breeding codes. It's a courtship display. So that's a probable indicator of breeding. So um, so listening for these things, being familiar with the sounds that they make and using that for atlasing is really, really helpful. There are gonna be cases where uh, you might observe a higher breeding behavior. You might, you might stumble, you know, you really have to be lucky in a lot of ways, but um, you might stumble upon a uh, nesting site and have the adult uh, put on a distraction display. Um, so you never have to actually see uh, the eggs or the bird or the uh, young. Um, but seeing a adult doing this display, like dragging their wing across the ground, trying to lead you off, you know, that's a confirmation that they're breeding. So that's an extreme uh, behavior for them. Um, so yeah, again, take lots of notes of the things that you see um, and like, you know, reinforce that using your phone is a perfectly acceptable way of documenting um, these, these species. So. If you're not really that familiar with the atlas, you don't know what I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I, can, I can help you with that. So um, send me an email and uh, I can get you those resources. But um, for those of you that are out there atlasing, um, these are some tips for you. So when should you atlas for these birds? So yeah, follow the safe dates as a, as a general indicator, although you may see behaviors outside of the safe dates. Um, Going out at dusk and dawn is, is when you'd go out and look for those uh, crepuscular species like the uh, nighthawk and uh, you know many of those other birds that are part of the um, chorus right at dusk. So um, that's a great time to go out and listen for them. Uh, nights are, uh, nights during the breeding season. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm saying there. So nights during the breeding season are when most of these species are our, our vocal would be, uh, you know, the Eastern Whippoorwill, go out on calm nights uh, when the uh, wind is low, like I said, no precip and a nice illuminated moon. And actually when atlasing for um, Whippoorwill, you know, during those periods between the lunar cycles that we talked about, um, going out in the evenings, you can sometimes hear Whippoorwills vocalizing. They'll, they'll also vocalize at dusk. So yeah, just to point you towards a resource and how you can put this in the, the chat, um, mainnightjar.com. So there's a number of resources on this. This is our project website for this, this uh, effort. Um, there's resources that are on there for helping to improve um, breeding observations and identification uh, in general for a number of these, these birds. And, and uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll pop over there and look at, the, uh, look at that. Um, so uh, there are profiles and uh, audio recordings, so you can go through and read um, detailed accounts on each of these birds and what to look for. Um, and then there's some, a bunch of different guidance uh, documents, um, data sheets, our project handbook, um, volunteer. We just recently added a volunteer placard and handout um, for, for folks to bring with them on their surveys. 
Um, and uh, yeah, there's a quiz on there if you want to test your skills. So here's a here's a, the nightjar observations to date in the main bird atlas. So um, as you can see, uh, there aren't a lot of confirmations for either of these species. Uh, those are the black squares, and I know this is they're little little tiny dots on on a, a fairly small map, but. Um, yeah, there are eight confirmations of Eastern Whippoorwill and uh, seven confirmations for common Nighthawk. Um, those light purple um, blocks that you see there are observed. So there's in that in those instances, the observations were outside of the breeding season. And, and so they, uh, they don't count as, uh, as they're, they're not even possibly breeding uh, according to those observations. Um, so uh, given that the common nighthawks range is throughout the entirety of the state and uh, Eastern Whippoorwill we know is, is found through much of the uh, southern portions of the state, the area that they, uh, that we think that they're at in their lowest abundance is up in the northwestern part of the state. But um, so we expect that to be a fairly empty part of the map, but they certainly could be up there in, in small numbers. Um, you know, there's there's still a lot of work to be done to fill this out. Um, the observations that we collect as part of the uh, Nightjar monitoring project, the road-based surveys, goes right into the same database as the uh, atlasing effort. So you're seeing all of the uh, observations that have been collected thus far. So um, we need your help. Uh, there are a number of routes still available. Of the 63, there are 12 unadopted routes right now. And so I'll read these off here. So if you're in Newfield, Baldwin, Durham, uh, Montville, Chesterville, Exeter, St. Albans, Medford, uh, Burlington, Lakeville, Island Falls, or Sherman in willing to take a drive over to Katahdin Woods and Waters, um, you know, these are where those routes are. They are still available. Um, if you want to adopt them and cover them for the season, that would be fantastic. Um, with the uh, means to do that, you can do right through our website, or you can contact me right at my email address and say that you're interested. Uh, volunteers can adopt multiple routes. We have a handful of, of volunteers that cover cover a few each season. Um, again, it's a it's a couple hours in the summer, so it's it's a a small <laughs> a small piece of time, um, and it it really helps us out. Uh, the the window that we can conduct these surveys is, is very small um, and the conditions have to be just right. So when there's, there's a really good night to be out surveying, man, we need you know, everyone out there on those nights and those, those routes all run. So um, yeah, that would, that would be a huge help if, if uh, you would be willing to cover one of these routes for us. And uh, you know, if you're not able to cover one of these routes, you know, um, atlasing in general is also hugely helpful. So uh, certainly would encourage you to take part in the main bird atlas uh, for night jars or for, for any other species. Um, you know, uh, it, it requires uh, a huge number of people to pull off a project of that size. So um, definitely encourage you to take part in both the atlas and the main night jar monitoring project. So Again, um, the Night Jar Monitoring Project is a special species survey. It's not the only one. If you're interested in any of these other projects, uh, just reach out to me, put the project name or you know, something similar uh, right in the, the uh, subject of the email. And uh, Hallie, you can add my email to the, the uh, chat if you haven't done that already. But um, yeah, if you're interested in any of these projects, reach out. I would love to, to help you get started. and. Uh, you know, there's still time to sign up. The, the breeding season is, it's underway, but it's about to really, really kick off soon. So, um, you know, it'll be a great summer for, for participating in these projects. Another way that you can support uh, these projects is through the uh, Bird Atlas's Sponsor of Species um, program. You can essentially adopt any uh, breeding bird that's found in Maine um, and there's a number of different uh, levels of, uh, for, for uh, contribution. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's really something for, for everyone. Um, 
the uh, birds can be adopted for each of the years of the atlas. So there's multiple years and, uh, and uh, yeah, you can put in a dedication and then the adoption will show up in the actual printed version of the atlas on the species uh, page within the atlas. So, uh, you know, you're, you want to go out there and adopt Nighthawk or Whippoorwill, great. Um, that, that supports these projects, uh, it supports the, the atlas in general, but uh, it, it makes it so we're able to do, do these uh, really important uh, conservation projects. So there's a bunch of additional resources here. Many of these have already been posted in the chat, but uh, yeah, there's our project website, um, the main bird atlas, just in general, uh, that'll, that'll lead you to a lot of different places. Um, the, the atlas page has a um, designated page for all of the special species projects that has guidance on um, you know, making observations of nocturnal birds, of grassland birds, um, and uh, wetland birds. And then I've put on a few um, links for bird identification resources. Um, All About Birds is also an, a, an excellent place to start. And there's lots of good information on there. So um, that's a great place to, to explore if you're looking to improve your observations. I think that is, yep, that's the end of the presentation. I'll leave this up for now. So Let's see, what do we got for time here? Okay, so we've got about a half an hour. So I would like to really quickly show you um, our project website. So we're gonna stop the share real quick. Give me one moment and I'll have that up for you. Navigating through my tabs here. Sorry, guys. All right. Um, here we go. Okay. Uh, all right. Are you seeing my screen, Howie? You can unmute and tell me if you are. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So this is the project site for the main night jar monitoring project. Um, on this front page, you'll see a tab at the top. Um, it has a number of resources. So the birds we study, you can go through, you can look at uh, groups of birds and look at accounts for each of them. So I'll show you what that looks like. So lots of information on there. Um, there's uh, the audio recording I was telling you about. There's information about um, breeding evidence, what specifically to listen for and, and uh, look for. Um, so we have that for night jars, owls. So yeah, there are some shorebirds that, that turn up. So we've got uh, Wilson snipe and American woodcock and uh, killdeer all, all turn up. Um, so uh, there's a lot of good, good resources on there. Um, in addition, so on our resources tab, we've got the monitoring handbook, uh, atlasing for night jars. So just some general guidance, uh, the volunteer placard. So uh, you can put it up on your car don't be surprised if you're doing these and someone pulls over and tries to check on you. Generally, I mean, just about everyone has been super friendly and they're excited about the work that uh, we're doing. Um, but, uh, it, you know, these are time sensitive surveys, so there's not a lot of time to chat. And so with that in mind, I just recently put together this volunteer handout uh, that you can print off and keep a copy in your car so you can uh, give that to them and that gives them some, some info on the project. Um, there's also a survey calendar. There's the quiz I was telling you about. So what the quiz looks like, you go on, a bunch of numbered uh, audio recordings down at the bottom. There's a key so you can test that out. Um, there's a blog, uh, FAQ. So a lot of these questions come up regularly. Um, so you can go on there and if you, you run into you know, a, a question, you can check that out. At the same time, you can just send me a message and that's perfectly fine too. Um, so on the volunteer tab, if you click on volunteer, uh, here is the sign up portal. You put in all your information. You can choose how you'd like to take part. 
and you can put in, uh, so if you're interested in a specific route, uh, you know, Durham, you could put that in there, or you could just say kind of a county, um, anything's fine. Um, just put that down. And then there's a little checkbox that says whether or not you'd like to be part of the night jar reserve and help fill in for others. Um, all right, and on here, we also have the routes tab. So here is a map that shows you all of the remaining routes. Uh, these little whippoorwill icons mark the approximate location of each of them. Um, so you can click on them and it'll have the title or you can just hover over them. Um, so yeah, if you need to identify the route, that's how you do it. Um, and then you just go over to the volunteer page and, and uh, sign up. And then uh, yeah, for date of submission, you can either send me your data sheets directly. Uh, you know, I, we do ask that you do send me at a minimum some of your, your sheets that's required, but you can also uh, download a spreadsheet and put your, your uh, put in your, in your data yourself if you want to, and then we'll go through it. Uh, that's very helpful, not required, um, but if you'd like to do that, that would be great. Um, so that is the project website. And I'll show you the handbook really quickly. So we just put together a new version of the project handbook that I'm hoping will be so much easier for folks to use. Um, we've got all of the relevant facts that I discussed tonight, plus much, much more um, available for you. You have the timings all recorded in here, the lunar cycles, um, reminders, um, everything that you need to complete your surveys. And right at the bottom of this, we even have like a, uh, like a sample of the data sheet, what it should look like. And there we go. So we've got the calendars broken down for moonrise, moonset, sunrise, sunset. That's all there for you, already completed and information about um, habitat. And then there's those breeding codes I was talking about when I was talking about atlasing. Those are all recorded in here with explanations. And then these are our data sheets. So um, this is the description. You just go through, put in your information, describe the location. And then the, uh, let's see, this is what our data sheet looks like. Pretty darn straightforward. We've got a sunset sheet and a moonrise sheet. And this is where you would record your observations. So that's all on there for you. and. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all on our project website. Okay, so if we have questions, now is the time. Let me see here. Okay, um, Hallie, do you wanna read off some of the questions for me? I just wanna make sure that I can cover them. Sorry about that, having an issue here with my muting. Oh, no problem. All right, Kathy would like to know how the routes are chosen, um, basically based on bird seen or likely habitat. Yeah, so the way that this was initially set up, it was uh, based on a, a couple of different habitat characteristics, not necessarily where the birds are seen. We're interested um, in habitat because it's just as important for us to know if areas of suitable habitat uh, are not, um, you know, not occupied by these these birds. Um, so, yeah, it was they were selected by habitat. Um, we're talking a little bit about um, about root creation, so that more additional roots may become available, but that's that's not really on the table for right now. Um, uh, but yeah, that's they were the roots were selected based upon habitat. All right, what's the next question? Kay um, is asking, does the male competitive singing with the increased speed um, raise designation to probable? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, so while it's it's possible that the the competition between those two birds, uh, it, you know, the speed is driven by that competition between those two birds, you it's hard to know that necessarily if that's the driver. But the um, you know the presence of multiple singing males, so seven or more singing males. 
uh, will bump that up to a probable code. So if you're in a site that is uh, really dense with whippoorwills, which you know there there are a few sites that are like that. Um, they're not super common, but you can get into a, a patch where there's lots of different singing males. Um, that would be uh, an instance where singing alone would bump it up to probable even without the seven day duration. What's the next question? Sorry, I was speaking, but it wasn't picking me up. Um, this Alice writes the safe dates for Whippoorwill are May 25th to July 25th, yet the Southern Maine first window starts on May 19th. Yeah, so that's that's partly due to the, so this project is a long-term project and it's gonna run, it started before the Atlas and it's gonna run right through until, uh, you know, beyond the Atlas. This will continue after this Atlas closes. Um, so the safe dates weren't, weren't, uh, the, weren't accounted for necessarily in determining those survey windows. Um, you know, those are really important pieces for the, for the Atlas, but there's something that we can account for our, on our end if a survey takes place before the safe dates, uh, if there's a singing bird there. Um, it's, it's not an issue. Um, so those safe dates are driven by uh, uh, approximations of the whippoorwill arrival time and, uh, and then some lag time for the migrants to move through and the suitable uh, lunar conditions to uh, come on. So um, yeah, so it does start slightly before the uh, safe dates open. It's not a problem. Um, if whippoorwills are detected at that site, it's gonna get run again and uh, that will bump it up to uh, an S7 either way. So it's, it's totally, totally fine. Bob wants to know whether nighttime temperatures influence calling by whippoorwills. Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, it does seem to. Uh, we had a instance a few years ago where, um, you know, the, during the first window, it was extremely cold. And uh, we had volunteers going to sites that were traditionally, um, you know, uh, great, great spots for whippoorwills. And they were getting very few detections. Um, but uh, yeah. So again, we have that second that second window when when the uh, volunteers can go out and and collect those observations, and in instances like that where we we have uh, you know a widespread uh, environmental uh, you know uh, factor at play, we can slightly adjust our survey window, and that's something that we decide at the time. Um, so uh, just follow the follow the guidelines within the handbook. And uh, you know, we would make an announcement if we needed to, if if things were looking like we needed to hold off slightly. But um, yeah, uh, it does seem to be a factor, and uh, they they do seem to be a little bit quieter when when things end up dropping down and, and are a little are a little chilly. So this was answered um, briefly by another participant already, but just to touch on this, as far as exact routes within the area like Baldwin, Nathan is wondering, do you guide us where to go? Yeah, so uh, yep, the routes, uh, you, you would end up with a set of uh, coordinates and a map that would say specifically where each of those points are located. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in the Baldwin route, You'd, you'd know exactly where to go. It's all pre-established. It's the same route run every year uh, consistently. Yep, I see William there said there were 10 stopping points. Yep, so 10, yep, 10 stopping points, nine miles total of driving. And Nathan writes, for our edification, are the best habitats for these species clear cuts, open fields with woody edges? So yeah, it depends. Um, so the whippoorwills use two habitat types. They are edge species, so they, they are found on the edges of uh, woodland areas and end in open areas where they forage. Um, you know, clear cuts and more open areas, night hawks uh, will sometimes use clear cuts or bird over areas, barrens, blueberry barrens, um, uh, to some extent grasslands and dunelands. Um, but yeah, uh, whippoorwills generally, yeah, they use a lot of, uh, you know, open understory forest and they nest right in the leaf litter. So areas with uh, some duffy um, leaf forest floors generally is where you'd find whippoorwill. Bob would like to know, um, 
how do you uh, do you get the information that is submitted into eBird? So yeah, there are there are a couple options. So you can um, put those observations in yourself or uh, alternate and and then send us the data sheets. We'd still get the data sheets. Um, and then alternatively, if you uh, just send us your data sheets, then we can batch upload them to eBird and we can upload them directly to your eBird account. Or if you don't want that, we can upload them to a, um, you know, a separate anonymous account or project specific account. Um, but yeah, either way they end up on eBird. Um, either you can, you can put it in yourself. Um, one of the advantages of putting it in yourself is that you can add notes in really easily right at the time, which is uh, super helpful. Um, there's you know, a lot more information. When we batch upload them, there's not, they're not necessarily going to have all the, the notes that you recorded on your data sheet. So if there's you know, uh, really specific stuff that you want to see on there, um, you can, you can uh, upload them yourself and record those things. And then you can go back and, you know, once we've uploaded them to eBird under your account, you can go in and, and make edits. That's, that's fine. Um, so if you have like a, a recording of a vocalizing bird that you'd like to have included there, you can upload that to the, uh, the checklist. It's your checklist. We've just uploaded it for you. Um, so yeah, there's a number of ways that you can get it up onto to eBird. Okay, so there's a question and an observation in this next one. So Kay says, since Eastern whippoorwill are a species of concern, is there an effort being made to protect areas where they're breeding? I was shocked last year to see how much sand had been mined on Old School House Road in Norwich Walk between the first and second lunar cycles last year. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, um, you know, there there hasn't been a lot of uh, effort to manage or to um, conserve whippoorwill habitat specifically. There are areas that are conserved um, that have whippoorwill, like the Kennebec Plains. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of one of the, the big drivers of this project is to get out and document these areas and, and to make the case that these species require even more robust conservation um, attention. And uh, yeah, so yeah, that's uh, obviously disheartening when you see a, an area like that that's being affected, but that's exactly why we're out there gathering those observations. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good observation to have. And, if you see it, certainly record it on your, you know, if you see something like that, you know, if you, if you're monitoring a route annually and you find that you're at a site that's changed radically, you know, certainly make uh, a lot of comments about that in your, in your data sheet, because that's super, super valuable information. Kathy would like to know, can non-survey participants know where the survey areas are so that we could possibly hear an IGR? Yeah, I mean, there. This is all. This is all public information. So nothing, nothing's off limits as far as if you're interested in knowing where specific routes are. But remember that the routes are not necessarily indicators of where night jars are. They're indicators of where we expect them to be. Um, but if you're interested in in listening for night jars, um, I can I can certainly set you up with a, a handful of of good locations to go out and listen for them and to become more familiar with them. Um, you know, uh, reach out to me uh, and I could set you up with a, a handful of, of good places. But, um, you know, just to put one out there, like I said, the Kennebunk Plains, there are whippoorwills that are already out there singing right now that are making their way through. They, they just got to Maine um, the last few, over the last few days. And uh, that's a great place to go out and listen for them, specifically head towards the McGuire Road down on the Kennebunk Plains. And uh, that's a good place to, to hone your your skills with uh, night jar ID. All right. So uh, Hallie's downstairs with our uh, seven month old who I can hear is crying. So I'm going to spare her from having to read this question with a crying baby. It's actually in the next room. So it's up to you. I'll just read it. Um, so I see Kay, you asked, uh, I took a screenshot of the 12 available routes and the contact info. May I share that on Facebook? to help get the word out. Yes, I would love that. Please do that. Um, so uh, certainly go on to our project website. So mainnightjar.com, volunteer, it's the volunteer tab, and then you click on roots and feel free to send that to everyone you know, um, send any of this information to anyone you know, because the, the more people that we have out uh, documenting these species, the better. 
the more people that we have out either uh, running these surveys or um, you know even if they're at, if they're out atlasing and they start incorporating F Nightjar focused uh, efforts into their atlasing efforts, that's going to be hugely beneficial. So yes, please do share. And there is one more question that was sent directly to me here. I'm just going to read that one before we head out. Yep. Um, so Johnny is hoping for some clarification. So um, I have, how long is a route? Do you walk between each point or do you drive between them? Can you touch on that? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So the, the routes, like I said, they're nine miles long in total with 10 points, mile between each point. Um, so it is uh, important to drive between points. You might be able to bike between points, but I would strongly encourage driving uh, just because it's a little safer and more visible. Um, but yeah, the point, the, the, the importance of the, the vehicle is just getting from point to point rather quickly. So you don't want birds moving around a lot between each point. So, um, you know, just try to complete your six minutes of survey time and then quickly make your way to the next point quit safely, adhering to the speed limits, um, uh, go to the, your, your next point. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what Evan, Evan reinforced that point. So yeah, it's dark out if you're gonna be biking, um, you know, extreme caution is, is recommended. Car is best in this instance. Bike is better much of the time. Car is best in this instance. Um, but yeah, so I think we've come to the end of our questions here. I'll give it, you guys one more, I'll give you 30 seconds. If there are any more questions, now's the time. We've got just a few minutes left anyway, so. All right, well then I'm gonna start winding down here. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email, whatever you need to, to get started with these. Uh, the survey window is coming right up, um, you know, uh, so if you're interested in these, jump right on it. I've been seeing folks in the chat saying there's a handful of people who've said that they're interested in covering routes. That's fantastic. Send me an email um, and we'll get that squared away and I'll get you everything you need. If you're a current volunteer and you haven't received the materials for this year, they're coming shortly. They're coming within, you know, very likely the next 24 hours. So uh, keep your eyes on your email. Um, but uh, yeah, I appreciate all of you spending your, your Cinco de Mayo uh, talking about night jars with me. And uh, I hope you're excited about these birds and that you'll, you'll get out there and, uh, and listen for them this summer. And uh, I think we'll leave it there. So thanks very much. And uh, I'll close it down. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Al.